Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, November 19th. Today's topic is Pika Pack, Social Emotional Learning. And our special guest is Amy Shaw. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Paula will now introduce Amy for us and ask her the newbie question. Good morning, everyone. This is Paula Noggle joining in from New Orleans, Louisiana. Amy Shaw is the co-founder and CEO of Pika Pack, an edtech startup that teaches social-emotional learning skills like self-regulation, empathy, and teamwork in the class and at home. Pika Pack is backed by Silicon Valley-based accelerator Image K-12, the EdTech vertical of Y Combinator, and the Unreasonable Institute. Amy earned an MBA from INSEAD, and she has gained extensive marketing experience through roles at Procter & Gamble, and most recently as Director of Retail Marketing at a consumer product startup. Amy is passionate about improving youth education and has previously taught in K-4 classrooms and, in, and advised and volunteered in education-related nonprofit organizations. I had the pleasure of meeting Amy at ISTE in Denver last summer. She sought me out and asked if I would be interested in using Pika Pack with my students during the school year and providing her feedback and thoughts about the program. After she showed me Pika Pack, I knew that this literacy-based approach to teaching social and emotional skills would be a great fit in my classroom. My students have thoroughly enjoyed the books and lessons that Pika Pack offers, and we have had great discussions on topics such as courage, empathy, and optimism. <clears throat> My students have even met and talked to Amy and Angie, the other co-founder of Pika Pack, through Google Hangout, and have received emails from the Pikaville characters, which you'll learn more about today. I am so thrilled to introduce Amy Shaw and have her share with you the awesomeness that is Pika Pack. Our newbie question, Amy, is what is character education? And now I'm turning it over to you. Thanks, Paula, so much for the kind introduction. So character education is the learning process that enables students uh, in the school community to understand and care about values such as respect, uh, justice, civic virtues, and a lot of the things that we're teaching in our program. But it encompasses not only their understanding, but also their role in that broader, uh, larger community how their attitudes and actions affect others, and really is a foundation for our society. And so uh, you'll hear me talk a lot about character education, but I'll mix it with social emotional learning, because I think they go hand in hand. And uh, we'll talk about that more today. So I will get started with the presentation. What I'll be doing is going through um, some Overall, some understanding and ideas around how to use um, social emotional learning in your classroom and really practical things that you can do to get started. Some of it's related to Pika Pack specifically, and some of it is just general tips and things that you can be doing. So I will start moving. So again, my name is Amy. You can find me on Twitter at amyshaw.dotca, or you can follow Pika Pack at Pika Pack. And what we'll re review today are a couple of things. So one, just a quick kind of overview on, on the importance of community building in your classroom or your home. Uh, what exactly is social emotional learning? We talked about character education, but how that relates to it. Uh, three, the meat of the, the presentation is around tips and lesson ideas that you can start using right away. Uh, four is the considerations on how to implement this. So uh, I did inter interviews with over 300 teachers across the country and really learned that you know, there are a number of barriers. And, and, and so part of what we've been doing with Pika Pack is understanding how do you overcome those barriers and how do we really promote overall to educators how they can start incorporating this and make this possible. And then lastly, 
Um, we have a link uh, which uh, we've provided uh, with the Live Binder around um, just like other types of links and articles and books that you can use um, to con continue to support this development. So a quick thing on community building. So it's really important for your students to feel, um, and I'm sure anyone here at this session, you know, spending their Saturday morning to come in and learn about uh, social emotional learning knows the importance of really creating a safe community where uh, where everyone feels like it's, it's 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 they feel included and it's no longer just about that individual but but the overall kind of like we like the overall community. And one activity you can do to support that, which I'm sure many of you have done at conferences or events is the idea of um, called everyone stand up if you. And so you can uh, list off things like, you know, everyone who's um, born on the East Coast, everyone who's born on the West Coast, they stand up and they can then group into to certain areas and then talk about, you know, growing up in a certain area. Um, this could be a way to kind of celebrate the differences and how um, the commonalities are uh, within an overall community and start and spark a discussion. So there's tons of resources on this. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but it's really important for uh, educators to really foster that sense of community, to really model that, and to continue, you know, making sure that uh, that's preserved and that's really supported throughout the school year. So the next area um, we'll talk about is, you know, what exactly is social emotional learning? And you'll see a lot of references in the source to Castle. And Castle is uh, probably the thought leader, the, the leading researchers in terms of uh, the development of social emotional learning research and um, kind of standards and practices around it. And so we've taken a lot of uh, learning from them and best practices, and that's what's included a lot in this presentation. You'll see that there's like five key areas in this wheel, and that's what will kind of break down the different lesson ideas and how that relates to specific character topics. So what is social emotional learning? You'll see an acronym SEL, um, same thing, but social emotional learning is a process through which children and adults will actually learn how to apply five key areas. So A, understand and manage emotions. Uh, B, set and achieve positive goals. Uh, C, we'll be able to feel and show empathy for others. D is establishing and maintaining, you know, really positive relationships. And then lastly, it's really being able to make responsible decisions and understanding the impact of those. So going into like more of the meat of this, we're going to break down those five areas I just spoke about and really understand how we can uh, bring this to life in our classroom. And I'll go into each of those definitions in a little more detail as well. So self-awareness is the first one. And this is really the ability to accurately recognize one's emotions and thoughts and how this influences uh, behavior. This can include you know, assessing their understanding and strengths and limitations and really feeling a sense of confidence and optimism. So when we think about um, in character education kind of topics or what's on the, on the peak attack program, you'll see things like self-regulation, empathy, honesty, and optimism. So the way that peak attack works, and I'll show, show you a little bit, a bit more later on, but Paula um, referenced this, is that we use narratives and literacy as a key part um, to be able to teach these concepts. And so this is something we heard loud and clear from talking to educators that, you know, using stories is such a great way to show how a character models, you know, the different conflicts or resolutions of, you know, countering that kind of behavior or character trait. Um, you can see the emotion in the character's face and kind of, you know, explore that with the students. And so with Pika Pack, this is one of our stories. We actually, my co-founder Angie, writes these stories with educators and experts to be able to really understand how do you kind of dig deeper on self-regulation, for example. And that's the story where Leo here is one of our key characters. He's going to school and he's highly nervous about, you know, starting his first day, which is a really relatable thing. And when he gets to school, he realizes that he's not the only one that's feeling different emotions, that all his, you know, classmates are, 
you know, either hyperactive or, you know, distracted and whatnot. And so it's a great way for students to explore. And I was actually speaking with a counselor yesterday. And she was just so impressed that her students all of a sudden, you know, identified with the different behaviors. And one of them who was, you know, constantly, like he actually started break dancing during the read aloud, <laughs> eventually stopped and said, wait a second, I'm being just like Cody. I'm being distracting and affecting the other students. And like, like not maybe those, those specific words, but he, was, he realized that he was affecting the others in the classroom. And then all of a sudden he ended up like, you know, calming down and saying, you know, that's not a calm body. We learned all about how the peak attack tiles are, you know, learning to be calm. I should, I should also think about that too. And so it's, it's just a great way to use literacy. And um, on Pika Pack's website, you'll see actually in every overview, we not only you know have our own stories, but we actually recommend other literature that you can reference and use in your classroom. And there's tons of great resources that really help um, talk about these. And, and, and so that's a, a key part of it. Another piece of it I'll mention is um, with Read Allows is having good questions to ask before, during, and after, and really kind of sparking that discussion and dialogue. So in, in on Pika Pack, you'll actually see in the read aloud lesson plan specific questions that you can ask um, throughout the read aloud experience and really point to the different emotions and kind of what's happening in the story. Um, the other thing that you'll see is that in the corner um, there is a Pika Pack logo. And some of these lesson ideas, uh, you will be able to find them on um, the Pika Pack website. Some of them are referenced uh, to other kind of sources that we found online. So in another example of self-awareness is an activity where students practice demonstrating and guessing their feelings with a partner. Um, this is helpful for them to understand. Um, so for example, like one student will have to you know, pick an emotion um, and act it out while the other one will have to um, kind of guess what, what, like what they're feeling, you know, what are the different kind of triggers to that. And so it's a way for them to kind of be able to recognize, recognize and understand those different kind of feelings. Another activity that's really fun for the younger kids is talking about things that actually bother them. Um, uh, so this is called It Bugs Me When. And uh, what they would do is create this little bug. Um, and then they would be able to kind of identify things that, you know, things that can maybe get under their skin and uh, kind of understand why that happens. And um, be able to talk about these things and recognize them are, are very important even at a young age. So the next section I will talk about is um, the ability to regulate one's emotions, thoughts, and behaviors effectively in different situations. So this is the, you know, includes managing stress, uh, controlling impulses. Um, and this really relates to uh, topics such as uh, self-regulation again, honesty, courage, and perseverance. Um, and so how do you, looking at this slide, it's like things like how do you stay in charge of your own emotions and actions? How do you be the boss of yourself? Um, and so I'm going to go into a couple of ideas. So going back to literature, um, so the thing that uh, referencing back to the story I mentioned in the from uh, about Leo, he actually um, uh, explores that. For example, Cody is being you know playful and and actually distracting to his peers, and by identifying that he was being distracting, he was able to understand that you know he can find other ways to calm himself down. Uh, to be able to not affect others and, and really can kind of be able to understand his own emotions. Another really popular um, lesson that you can do, or activity you can do with students are called calming jars. And this is really to understand how um, it's kind of a metaphor for um, their minds. And so uh, I will include um, afterwards kind of the, the steps on how do you actually create a calming jar. But it's fantastic and be able to see um, kind of students kind of see the, the metaphor of it. So how it works is that um, when you shake the bottle, you'll see all the, the glitter and, and all the kind of um, 
pieces move, moving around like a whirl and you can't see anything through the jar. And then, uh, and so that's a metaphor for when you're, you know, upset or disruptive, uh, your thoughts and feelings can cloud your mind. And then you'll have the students actually watch the, the jar just kind of settle and sit and everything kind of calm down and get down to, and fall to the bottom. And be able to see through all of a sudden, you know, the jar is kind of like the ability by having your calm mind, you're able to see that clarity. And, and some, some educators have said that they actually use this, you know, when there is a moment in the class where, um, you know, a student is uh, needing to calm themselves down, they can use these jars as a way to kind of uh, help them focus and um, use this as a kind of metaphor. Another fun activity is called feeling stance. Um, so for this activity, students move or dance around the classroom to different songs. And um, as, you see, as you call out different emotions, they have to kind of express uh, that. Um, as well as, you know, there's other ways that you can actually uh, help them kind of like as they're dancing, they can look at um, how do they get from that state of like dancing to a state of calm. And so you can stop and ask the students to um, kind of practice how they get back to that, that element of calm. Another popular thing that some teachers will use are classroom yoga. Uh, you'll see some photos there of our fun Pika Pack pals doing yoga moves. Um, this obviously depends on your classroom and, and your students' uh, abilities, but even there are simple things that uh, many students uh, can start practicing doing, be it breathing or um, some of the stretches, and just the understanding of the element of being cognizant of their body um, and, the, and how, how these different poses can help them get to that state of calm. So the next uh, area, the third area that we'll talk about is social awareness. And so this is the ability um, to take perspectives and be able to empathize. And so this really relates to uh, empathy, uh, our unit on empathy at Pika Pack, and it really helps a uh, student understand, you know, the ability to uh, understand different perspectives, to recognize how this relates to their overall family, school, and community and really, really important. So in um, the story that we have around empathy, we actually have a student who moves from Mexico. And you know she misses home. And um, uh, the students actually are like, oh, she must be so excited to move here, and expected her to be you know, thrilled and excited. And she's actually a little sad about moving home and missing her friends. And um, through this story, they end up, you know, recognizing that and realizing um, her perspective in the matter and, you know, help her kind of feel more at home um, in, in the new community. And so this is a good way uh, for students to understand that, you know, even, um, even though they may see it one way, uh, someone else may see, you know, have a different perspective on um, the same kind of scenario. So, Different activities that uh, you could do in your classroom. One is called What Do You See? And this is really fun for students. Um, I don't know if everyone remembers the, the, the famous gold and white dress or black and blue dress. Um, but this can be done with any kind of optical illusion where uh, you're basically trying to get um, different students to see different things. And uh, by doing so, they, they start understanding that even though something can be the same image or the same, you know, same kind of thing that they see as a perspective that they have different, they can have different kind of uh, views of the same thing. Um, and this is a really playful kind of fun thing that um, students can kind of explore and kind of see that uh, point be made. Another great way um, is kind of having a classroom friend or pet. And this could be, it doesn't have to be a real life pet. It could be a stuffed animal, a doll, a statue, or a plant. Uh, we actually had a teacher in New Jersey who uh, went out and got a Leo hedgehog stuffed animal. And it was amazing because these students were so empathetic. Uh, I went to visit, and they were doing a play on respect. and. Uh, they actually were, you know, showing disrespect to, you know, the character Leo in the in the play. And at the end of it, um, all the students rushed to the stuffed animal Leo and started petting him and saying, reassuring the the pet 
that Phantom Leo that, you know, it was just a play. They didn't mean to hurt his feelings and that, you know, they really did love him. And so it was just interesting to see how this pet, you know, Leo in the classroom um, really was something that they took care of. They under they wanted to make sure that he felt included, um, that, you know, they had to make sure that uh, he, he felt he felt like, you know, his needs were being met as well. And so I was just so impressed, especially in kindergarten. This is just a great, uh, I guess, way for it to be more tangible and uh, for the students to understand that. And I can share a video afterwards that shows how this, um, this teacher actually did this in their classroom. The next area that I'll talk about is relationship skills. And so this is really, you know, relating to things like teamwork, um, being able to kind of develop those healthy relationships um, uh, with different kind of individuals and people who may have different kind of interests or um, uh, and really being able to have that ability to cooperate, to listen, to resolve conflicts, uh, which is so essential if you think about uh, being in, in the younger students but longer term when you get into high school and to university and the workplace, uh, being able to have these relationships is so key. So in one of our books, um, this is an example from Teamwork. Uh, it's very popular, especially with the boys, because they love um, robots. And in this book, uh, the characters have to learn um, about, about fixing a robot together and um, the idea of building this robot together. And so that was, uh, you know, for, for a lot of students, they kind of be able to see that um, kind of cooperation and how they were able to resolve uh, conflicts and be able to like build something together with a common goal was um, kind of help them understand that point. Oh, looks like it's missing an image here. Um, so this is a, an activity you can do, just an image here of Lego. Um, and you could do this with Lego, you could do this with um, different kind of uh, tools, but the idea is that um, uh, you'll create a structure, for example, of like a house or, or something that's simpler, you could draw it even. And um, what another person on the team will actually have to be uh, facing back to back to each other. And the person who, who made the structure or the drawing will have to describe um, describe what they've built and communicate that effectively to the person that's not facing them. And they'll have to rebuild, be it with Lego or drawing it out again, um, and, and learn how that communication is really uh, needs to be clear, that they have to kind of work together uh, to be able to replicate what the first person made. And so it, I, I've been in classrooms watching this, and it's interesting because, you know, there'll, there'll be some trial and error of what works and what doesn't work, and then eventually they'll start getting a groove and, and getting it. And then once they do, they really feel proud that they're able to, you know, build something together collectively. Uh, another activity that we have, so relating to the story in, in the robot, um, one of the activities is actually that teams actually have to make their own robot. And in some cases, some classes just draw, you know, will draw it together. Um, and some actually, they take materials like this that you see in the picture, and they'll make a robot. And, and what they do uh, is that the teams will create, you know, four or five people. Um, and each of them will have a task um, that they individually have to do. So say one has to do the head, another person does the arm, another person does the body, the, the, the legs. And um, they collectively had to decide, you know, what is our robot going to be doing? What superpowers does this robot have? And, um, and then individually, they'll have to kind of figure out how are their tasks going to la ladder up to this overall goal? And how are they going to make the different pieces to make this possible? And uh, it's just a fun kind of hands-on way that uh, the students can kind of work together and understand how working together they can have this collective goal and, and produce something. At the end, often, you know, you can have the students as a team uh, display and explain to the rest of the class how they did it and what they, you know, what their goal was and how they delivered it and uh, be able to understand like, and reflect on, you know, what that process looked like. So the last area I'll talk about is responsible decision making. And this is um, really understanding the choices of, you know, your behavior and being and how that impacts others and the consequences of that. Uh, be it, you know, from an ethical standpoint or safety standpoint or social norms. 
Uh, but it's really understanding, you know, how do you be, like, how your actions really impact um, uh, other people and, and other kind of choices. So uh, one of the key kind of topics that relate to this, for example, is honesty. And, and uh, our book on honesty, we have actually a character who, you know, she's like this straight A student, does really well, and everyone expects uh, her to have like the best science project. And, you know, she actually can't think of one. And she ends up being dishonest because she wants to keep up this perception. And, you know, she ends up lying. And at the end of the day, her dishonesty uh, impacted her best friend. And, you know, he was really disappointed. And he was like, you know, I, I hoped that, you know, as my best friend, you could be honest about this. And so it just explores kind of the impact of making these kind of choices and um, how, you know, something small could become actually, you know, really bad, like that, uh, you know, lie and how that can um, kind of influence the others. Uh, a way to kind of show like the positive impacts of decisions is also uh, an activity called kindness in the community. And as a class, you can kind of determine things that you can do in your broader community that would be kind. So, you know, I think about uh, also like websites like Random Acts of Kindness uh, that just recently passed. Um, but you know, as as a class, they can decide. You know, we want to um, you know clean up the community and pick up litter, or we want to. Um, thank all the safety uh, crosswalk guards. And um, as a group, they would decide on these things, and then they'd actually carry them out, and then be able to reflect on you know, what kind of impact this had on the broader community and why it was important. So I wanted to get through kind of the five key areas really quickly. I'm going to go into now some considerations. And this is like really tying back to what we learned uh, when we spoke with a ton of educators from across the country. And um, it's been a pleasure working with Paula, but it's also been you know, really helpful for us to learn from folks like herself and others about you know, how do you really make this possible? Everyone we talked to really talked about how this is super important. Like These are topics, and I think in the poll questions, everyone talked about how um, you know, this is uh, something that we need to incorporate. But a lot of folks end up coming back saying, well, at the end of the day, I really need to meet my Common Core standards. I need to, um, you know, get my objectives out of the way, and, and like I can't justify time for like nice to have activities. And so here are some tips that we have um, to make it po more possible uh, for integrating. So one thing to consider is trying to find activities that uh, incorporate or, or align to Common Core standards. So good examples are, as I mentioned, read alouds. Um, for most, especially elementary educators, read alouds are a natural thing. You do them every day or often every day. And um, to be able to have resources that align to that and, and spark that you know, strong discussion are an easy way then to kind of um, be able to do both. Um, as well as activities uh, that are aligned to ELA standards, so uh, writing and write, reading and writing activities, um, or also sometimes we found I've spoken to educators where they'll make, for example, perseverance part of the activity around a math exercise. And so there's ways to kind of incorporate and think about how you can reference these topics in um, not only just as um, you know, kind of standalone topics, but how they integrate or uh, within all topics uh, within the school day. And that was something that you know we did at Pika Pack, so we made actually all our lessons aligned to uh, English language arts um, uh, Common Core State standards. The second area I'll mention is like finding kind of bite size uh, flexible resources. So when we started off, we actually created these like 30, 40 minute lessons, and you know because we listened so closely, a lot of educators came back saying, "Uh uh, this is not going to make sense for my." Um, my classroom, I need like shorter kind of bite-sized things. And so we ended up, you know, learning that, you know, the ways that educators often were successful in incorporating this were into morning meetings, uh, breaks, or within like, you know, a part of the ELA block, for example. And, and having them really no more than like 15 to 25 minutes made it really possible. And so we made that adjustment in our lessons. The third area is around engaging in relevant um, 
kind of ideas and ways to incorporate. And so a couple of things that we learned, you know, having literature that uh, really resonates with students. So really fun stories or, or even videos. If you go to Common Sense Media, you actually can filter now by character topics. And so you can find like videos or movies that even kind of reinforce that topic. Um, you also can find a lot of current events. So I, I know, for example, in our perseverance unit, one of our educators uh, went beyond even the uh, historical leaders that we referenced and actually brought in folks like Jay-Z and Beyonce. <laughs> and, and so the students were so excited to see like people that they were really relevant to, but also learn about their story of perseverance as well. And so kind of making it relate to things that, uh, you know, are relevant to their lives uh, makes it that much more uh, relatable for them. And then the last area I'll mention is extending the learning with families. And um, there may be some families here that are homeschooling, but uh, overall, like I think everyone probably agrees that these are topics not only for school, but they're for life. And they're things that uh, need to be um, spoken about in kind of all aspects of life. And so uh, having this conversation at home in the family is really important. And what we, we, what we found is that a lot of families, you know, find this really important. They really do want to talk about this. And having a common vocabulary from the class to the home is really important. And so what we did is we worked with a, a researcher, a early childhood expert, who helped us kind of understand what were the appropriate kind of play um, and discussion-based activities or, uh, or kind of acti or, sorry, activities or discussions that can really happen in the home to reinforce that uh, piece. And so all our lessons actually have a at-home component and the ability for parents to actually reread the same storybooks at home for free because having that discussion at home is really important as well. So the next slide I have here is around resources. Um, we will put this on the live binder, but this is actually just a thorough list of different mindfulness and social emotional learning resources. I can't take credit for all of this. Actually, uh, a colleague of mine, um, or a friend of mine, uh, Julie Fadi, who uh, is a, a fantastic woman who's done a lot of research and kind of work around this area, has been kind of curating this content and wants as many people to really uh, get access to this, these resources. And she's been kind of compiling this for some time, so I'm happy to share that. So, oops, I went a little too far. Um, so a little more about Pika Pack. Uh, so overall, like what we're trying to do, and as you heard from me before, we're trying to help teachers and families really teach these concepts like gratitude and empathy, self-regulation. And we really do that through engaging stories that we've you know, designed ourselves uh, with our own set of characters and, and trying to overcome a lot of the barriers by making them really bite-sized and easy and aligned to core standards. Uh, I think someone has already shared, uh, um, I can definitely uh, talk about the research uh, in a little bit, but um, one of the things I mentioned is around the characters, and so we've actually designed a set of characters that reflect the diversity, uh, you know, more and more prominent in um, our society, and it shows a reflection of different, not only cultures, but talents, so we have, you know, um, Leo, who's a tinker, and he actually wants to be a 3D. He wants to do 3D modeling and printing. Or um, Lucia, who loves electrical engineering. Or Apollo, who likes robots. Or Zoe, who loves you know biology. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we want to be able to show kind of that diversity of those characters. Uh, we've also designed a whole world, and more of this will be coming out in the new year, but. There's actually a whole world called Peekaville and, you know, special buildings. And a big part of us is how do we create this, you know, ideal environment of, like, creativity and inclusion and celebrating, um, you know, these character traits and, and this type of uh, learning. And so this is something that's part of uh, the learning. And, and we'll be kind of sharing more of that uh, with a student login coming up in the spring um, soon. So we're always looking for beta testers, which I'll mention in a second. Uh, this is just another example of one of our books. Um, let's quickly show you. 
And then this is an example of uh, kind of like there's printable versions or uh, electronic versions that you can send to your parent community. But the idea is that you're able to kind of give turnkey activities and lessons and discussions that parents can do at home. They're not meant to be homework. They're meant to be things that uh, relate to kind of their lives and help them reinforce and use that common vocabulary at home. Uh, something I'll mention, so this is actually a peek at our new website. Um, we will be launching in January, and uh, we're looking for kind of a closed group of educators. It's not publicly available yet uh, to kind of help us critique and give us feedback about how we can continue to evolve. So if you're interested, please do connect with me either on Twitter or email, or I'll give you my calendar link. But we're always looking for great feedback and people to help us really say, this works, this doesn't work. We need to change this. And we're really responsive and um, uh, open to kind of that kind of feedback. I'm just going to skip this. Um, so I'll mention, yeah, this new site, if you do want to spend a uh, book of time and you're like, let's do this, uh, my calendar, I've actually made it publicly available. <laughs> Sometimes this is kind of crazy, but <laughs> it, it works for me. But it's amyshot at youcanbookme.com, and I'd love to chat with you. You can do a Google Hangout. Um, and so I can answer, I can switch to answering questions now as I have gone through the meat of my presentation. Um, I don't know if, uh, if I can kind of scroll through some of these. I know I saw one question around research. So every one of our lessons actually is referenced, uh, references research. Um, uh, if you actually go onto any, if you go to peakpack.com, you can actually sign up for a free account. Um, and if you click on any of these units uh, and click on any of the tabs, you'll be able to see uh, the lesson, uh, the specific research study that this references. Um, uh, the, the, you know, the author of that research and uh, why it's important to related to that reference. Why is it important for the students and their development? So we, we put a lot of care into that piece of it and we make sure that all our lessons are referenced. The second thing I'll mention is that we're actually participating in a couple of research studies this year. So we're actually rolling, we just rolled out a research study at a list of public schools across 27 school sites. We're working with uh, Dr. Um, Cole there. She's actually a former researcher at uh, Sesame Street, so it's pretty exciting to work with her. And what we're trying to do is look at the, you know, the impact of um, of our program with students and and, and teachers. Uh, I'll also mention we're doing a research study in Denver uh, with a preschool chain called uh, Mile High Early Learning, and we're really excited to work with them as well. Amy, I did capture some other questions. So, uh, what would a what okay, would a great. beta tester do? Ah, great question. So, beta testers are folks who ideally will uh, try out one lesson at least with their classroom uh, before January. And so, this could be a read aloud. Uh, this could be uh, using one of our lessons. Um, to give us feedback about, um, you know, what the student reactions are. We're always looking for, we've actually made some modifications to our, especially our kindergarten and pre-K lessons uh, based on feedback that we've received. So we're definitely looking for feedback on the actual content, but we're also looking for feedback on specifically how do you use our website. So our goal is to make it it's like super easy for any educator to you know sign up and be able to use our program. And so uh, we need to be critiqued on that. We need to be told, yes, this is easy, or nope, you need to make this better. And so we're looking for folks who can spend you know five, ten minutes on our site, click around, try the different features, and tell us whether this is actually really easy and or how we can improve it to make it uh, better for uh, more teachers. That's great. Uh, can Pika Pack be used anywhere around the world? Yes, so we have uh, educators uh, signed up in 89 different countries uh, already. Wow. So it could be, it's only available right now in English, but we are actually, if anyone's interested in our Spanish books, we just translated all our, our storybooks, the level one of our books. Um, in Spanish. So they're not publicly all available, just our first two books, but if anyone is interested, please let me know and I can, I'd love to get your thoughts on our, we just translated them, so we're looking for feedback mm -hmm. on them. But we're pretty excited to offer that language. 
everything I'll mention in our storybooks, there's actually three levels of our storybooks. So, uh, for example, Paula is in grade four, even though we don't have a grade four level, she's been helping us kind of understand, you know, how do we modify them or really appeal to a grade four class, but we actually have a chapter book, um, and we're finding that it's more appropriate for like grade three, four, five, and it's actually the same storyline, so beautiful illustrations, but it's actually 50 to 60 pages long, has richer vocabulary, you know, sometimes like one or two more conflicts in the story to resolve, and uh, it just helps for, you know, a more appropriate development, a developmentally appropriate kind of uh, reading experience for those students. Do you have to register to access all of the free resources? Yep, it's uh, just a, there is um, an ability to kind of preview things if you just want to see what it's like. Um, so on the home page, you, you see the sample account. But if you do want to see the full storybook or the lessons, you just need to mm -hmm. sign up for a free account. It takes like two minutes to sign up, and uh, there's no obligation to pay or anything, you can always use the free version um, as long as you like. And tell us more about the pro account. If you sign up for, pro, for a pro account as a teacher, who can use that access? Only the teacher? I think you mentioned something about coming student logins. Yeah. So with the pro account, it's, it is driven around like a classroom. So a teacher can set up their classroom. Um, they can invite all their parents into the learning process. So um, say I'm a teacher and I have 20 students in my class, I can mm -hmm. set them all up. I can track kind of the progress that's being made um, for those students on the, on the platform. And then I can also, uh, by email, invite, uh, either I can print off an invitation and give them a code, mm -hmm. or I can email them. Uh, a link to be able to access updates from me. So at the end of every lesson, I would just press complete and send update to parents, and parents would get a notification saying, you know, welcome to Pika Pack. Uh, today, you know, Johnny learned about gratitude, and here is a storybook that you can reread at home for free, and here's an activity you can do as well. Um, so it includes all that. Um, the student piece is something that we're actually uh, going to be testing mm -hmm. in the spring, so we are looking for beta testers for that as well. Um, and uh, the idea is that students would be able to log in and be able to access our storybooks, uh, be able to answer comprehension questions and activities, and that those kind of insights and uh, data would be given back to the teacher to understand how their students are progressing on these topics. So we're really excited to work on that. We're working with the game design school right now, so it's at the early stages, but in the spring we'll have uh, things that we'd like to test. And for all our beta testers, they do get a discounted price on the mm, pro license. Okay. Can you be a beta tester if you don't have a classroom? Uh, is this reference, if you're referencing to like a home environment mm -hmm. where you're using it, you could still, as long as there's an ability to, uh, I mean, if you still wanted to input on user experience design mm -hmm. or anything, yes, you can still be a beta tester. Or if you have, you know, children at home that you'd like to test this on, we're more than happy to also work with you. We actually have a, a number of homeschoolers in our community and, and parents who, um, who've either purchased or, mm -hmm. you know, have given us input on the product. That's well. wonderful. Mm -hmm. Those are the questions that I was able to find. Does anyone else have a question for Amy? I'm pausing for some, some typing. Who was involved in the design of the program? Oh, yeah, definitely. So my co-founder and I, um, we started it. Uh, we were actually based in Silicon Valley for a program at Apollo I mentioned mm -hmm. called Imagine K-12. And it's a program that helped graduate companies like Class Dojo and Remind. So we got to hear kind of the early stages about their experiences and it was very inspiring for us. And uh, we actually started off with a parent product that 
was very hands-on, uh, really fun, and it was educators who said, come into our classrooms, like help us, like how, like just give, give it a try, let us see how these lessons do in your in our classroom. And we went into four classrooms and consistently students were falling in love with our characters and our stories and uh, the teachers loved it too and they said, you know, we, we love your content. And um, we started working with a number of educators. We ended up putting one lesson together on gratitude and got 13,000 teachers wow. and educators signed up for this <laughs> one lesson. <laughs> and then we interviewed uh, about 100 of those. Um, they helped us kind of inform some of the design choices. We then, six weeks later, designed the first stage of our platform, interviewed another 30 educators. Um, and on our team, we have like a, we had like the early days when we first designed it, like a, a teacher who uh, works in preschool in, in grade one, um, and she kind of helped us write all our lessons. We have a curriculum designer who has a master's in curriculum design help us. We have a positive psychology expert, this guy Ronnie Habib, who works, he's in Silicon Valley. Uh, and then we also were really fortunate to get research grants to work with a PhD in early childhood education. Uh, her name is Dr. Uh, Kimberly Brazier, and she really helped us refine our stories and um, all the kind of kind of the learning materials and design kind of, kind of criteria around it. So it's been uh, kind of a collective effort, and a lot of people kind of helping us inform uh, and refine what we're doing. So that's why I constantly mm -hmm. always have mm -hmm. the data testers because they always help us. Um, we're always building new things, so we're always looking for people to help us kind of uh, that's make wonderful. a better product. Um, those were the questions that I was able to capture again. I think I'm going to turn this now over to Peggy, who will uh, tell us what's coming up next. Well, thank you so much, Amy. Okay. That is a delightful program, full of substance, and just so well thought out. I am really excited that you were able to share that with us today. I do want to remind everyone that we won't have a show next weekend because that is the Thanksgiving weekend in the United States. But the following week, we have a great featured teacher who basically teaches in a one-room schoolhouse. And it is going to be so much fun to hear the kinds of things that she does with a very small rural school. And then December 17th, we have another featured teacher. If any of you have met Valerie Lewis, you'll know that she is everywhere. And she has done so many great things with EduMatch and Pastoscope EDU and Periscope and just so many things. And I'm excited to have her share all of that with us. And then we'll take a winter break for a couple of weeks. And we'll return on January 7th to celebrate the new year and to review and celebrate all of the fantastic presenters and topics that we've had throughout 2016. It's always a fun kind of party show with prizes and all kinds of great things. So be sure and join us on January 7th. And with that, I'm going to let uh, Lori take us out. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his resources in one place, including host your own webinar where you can sign up for a collaborate session yourself. And as long as your session is public, it's free. You can also nominate a featured teacher like the two we're going to have in December by filling out a form at this URL. There's also a resource in the live binder for the featured teacher. And you can nominate yourself as well. As you exit the session, the survey should open up. Uh, there's a direct link for the survey. You can take the link from the chat box uh, or from within the live binder. At the bottom of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. And it prints out with your name. And thanks to Patty Ruffing for sending these out to everybody. Um, Please also make sure you use a personal email address to request this, not a school email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks to our special guest, Amy Shaw, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution. 
to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform and everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.